everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So today, uh, we are honored to have Mr. Hayashi to give his talk uh, titled Being Asian American. So first, I will ask Professor uh, Seiko Matsuzawa, professor in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology to introduce Mr. Hayashi. Um, so Professor Matsuzawa, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yo. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have a pleasure to uh, uh, have a wonderful talk from uh, Mr. Hayashi. Mr. Hayashi is the president of uh, the Dayton chapter Japanese American Citizen League and the chairperson of the Asian American Council of Great Dayton. He uh, formerly served as the director of the development and the finance of the Wesley Community Center in Dayton, Ohio from 2008 until his retirement in 2013. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Ayashi. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, you have already retired for long, but you know, uh, throughout his career, he worked for nonprofit organizations in the areas of community engagement, group facilitation, advocacy, diversity training, program administration, and organizational development. Mr. Hayashi also worked for United Methodist Church Organization for 30 years. He was an Associate General Secretary of the General Council of Ministries for 14 years. Previously, he served as Associate Council Director in the California Nevada Annual Conference. Throughout his long career, Mr. Hayashi worked with diverse organizations and groups. From 2008 to 13, he provided leadership as the president of the National Federation of Asian American United Methodist, which brings together 12 Asian sub-ethnic groups who speak over 15 different languages. Mr. Hayashi currently serves as secretary of Rebuilding Together Dayton a program which provides home repairs for senior citizens so that they may remain in their homes. He also does volunteer work with WYSO Public Radio, Yellow Spring, Ohio, and the Center for United Methodist Church. Please welcome Mr. Hayashi for this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayashi, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Matsuzawa. Uh, it's really a, a privilege and an honor for me to address you. And um, I know most of you are students at uh, College of Worcester. And uh, I want you to know that you have a special place in my heart because when I graduated college my, in my first uh, job, I worked for the Greater Portland Consulate Churches. And uh, we were working with a neighborhood program, uh, trying to reach uh, lower income persons and helping them to better themselves. And uh, we had students from the College of Worcester uh, come to Oregon for a school term and they worked alongside with us uh, as we assisted with everything from uh, after school children's program uh, to helping senior citizens uh, uh, find, uh, make life more livable as well as neighborhood projects. And uh, I was always impressed that the Worcester students one got very much engaged with us, but also that they really cared for people. And uh, so um, it's really an honor to uh, have this opportunity to address you this evening. We also are living in troubling times. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to, uh, to share at the very beginning is that we are very troubled with the war that's going on in Ukraine. And um, I think all of us are praying that uh, peace might prevail and that uh, people will be kept safe. And um, so um, I, I know I join with, with many Americans in saying that we need to be very uh, attentive and helpful to those going through these very difficult times. This evening, uh, I've been asked to uh, talk about what it is like being an Asian American. And so I'm gonna be uh, sharing some of my life experiences, the history of Asians in America, the experience of Japanese Americans during World War II, which my family uh, went through, uh, 
uh, the myth of the model minority, a term that uh, has been used uh, to kind of uh, say how, how great Asian Americans are and um, what it was really like growing up as an Asian American and uh, really some of the challenges that we continue to deal with today. So um, I hope that in our time together this evening, that you will uh, think of questions. Maybe you would like to make some comments. Uh, I hope that there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability um, because I think it's only by sharing and interacting with each other that we really can learn more. So um, I look forward to the opportunity to be in conversation with you. So let me begin. When I was in uh, grade school, um, I had to take an aptitude test as do all uh, fourth graders. And um, there was a line on the form that asked for my race. And so uh, not quite knowing what to put, I wrote the word mongoloid on it. And my teacher scolded me. She said, that's not right. And beside, you're not stupid. And um, what she was confused with is she was using the term Mongolism, which is a, a term used for a congenital mental deficiency. Uh, the characteristics for Mongolism are flattened forehead, slanting eyes close together. On the other hand, being Mongolian, is uh, at that time was one of three principal racial groups of humankind. That includes Asians, Eskimos, North American Indians, and, and they're characterized by yellowish skin, black hair, and slanting eyes. Now, my black hair is kind of turned gray. So, um, you know, that probably isn't true today, but uh, anyhow, those are some of the things, and, but it helped me as a young kid to really understand that race was a definition that people put on that may not be really always the best way of uh, type, typing people. Also, um, in my growing up, I was, I'm often asked, so how long have you lived in our country? And when I tell them that I was born here in America, uh, the response is often, my, but you speak English good. Well, English is really the only language that I really have learned. But this sets up a problem. Uh, the lack of history of Asian Americans as part of the classroom learning experience means that people don't know who we are. In the omission of our contributions, of how we've helped to improve American society in areas such as medicine, horticulture, engineering, and other ways um, are, are rarely uh, acknowledged. And then um, there is a failure that we acknowledge that we as Asian Americans are part of the woven fabric of American society. This results in many of us being called foreigners. Now, let's talk a little bit about Asian American history. In the early 1850s, Chinese laborers migrated to the United States. They were considered cheap labor. And they first worked in the gold mines, and then a little later in the agricultural jobs and factory work, particularly the garment industry. Chinese immigrants were almost totally men because that was all that uh, they felt uh, would, would be uh, persons who would work long hours and work hard for cheap wages. And they were particularly instrumental in building the, the railroads. And at that time, there was a push to get the railroads to go all the way from the East Coast, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, largely because the gold rush had just happened. And so um, there were congressional acts to make that possible. 
Irish immigrants started in Omaha, Nebraska, because that's where the train routes ended, and they pushed west. And then they used largely Chinese laborers to start in Sacramento, California, and go east through the Sierra Nevadas. They had to uh, dig tunnels, build bridges, do all kinds of things. Uh, but um, in the end, um, they um, were able to bring together uh, a nationwide rail network. And um, it's very interesting that uh, at the celebration of the driving of the Golden Spike to say that the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, the photograph shows many workers, but in that picture, there are absolutely no Chinese Americans pictured. And that was because they were frankly left out. They had worked hard, but they were not welcome at the, the celebration. Now, some Chinese laborers were successful and became entrepreneurs in their own right. And as their numbers increased, so did the strength of that anti-Chinese sentiment among other workers in the American economy. In other words, they became competitors. And Chinese laborers were forced to live in segregated communities, off uncrowded. And these areas later became known as Chinatowns. And since the communities were separate and frankly, the dominant culture uh, didn't really know what was going on there, rumors began to, uh, to uh, be created and tales were told that there was prostitution, the smoking of opium and gambling. Now, Chinatowns were considered exotic. In other words, they weren't really human. They were just that were kind of strange place. Well, by 1879, the advocates who wanted to restrict immigration succeeded in introducing legislation that limited the number of Chinese arriving on a boat to only 15 per ship. You know, prior to that, there were literally hundreds that would come on a ship. And three years later, the United States Congress enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 which ceased Chinese immigration for 10 years. And in 1892, that law was made permanent. Now, this was the first legislation that was passed in the United States that placed broad restrictions on immigration. And I might uh, parenthetically say that that Chinese exclusion law stayed on the books until 1943. And the only reason why it came off was we were involved in World War II and China was an ally of the United States. And so they decided they better get rid of that discriminatory law. In the, 19, in the 1880s then, Japanese laborers were brought in to replace the Chinese and to avoid the problems that they had had with uh, largely uh, Chinese men uh, the Japanese were uh, enabled to bring families. Community leaders thought that uh, this might calm the Japanese immigrants so that they can fit into the communities better. But as Japanese Americans became successful and frankly competitive, anti-Japanese sentiments emerged. Federal laws barred Asian immigrants from becoming naturalized American citizens. Now, you'll know that uh, during the Civil War, President Lincoln proclaimed the Emancipation Proclamation, and subsequently the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed, making African Americans U.S. citizens. But citizens were restricted that you either were white or black. The Naturalization Act in 1870 excluded alien ineligible for citizenship to primarily prohibit Chinese and Japanese immigrants from attaining citizenship. Now, at the same time in several Western states, they enacted what was called alien land laws. And this forbade Asian immigrants from owning property. Now, the Asians are pretty smart. 
their children who were born in the US were American citizens because they were born here. And so many of them, as they purchased property, purchased in the name of their children. But nonetheless, the owning of property was forbidden by the immigrants. In 1924, the immigration law was passed, which placed quotas on who could come into the United States. Europeans were generally welcomed and had very large quotas, but Asians had very, very few allowed into the United States. And that was true up until about 1965. And um, you know, that meant that the number of Asians allowed in the country were very small. Now I'll talk about this a little later, but during World War II, 120,000 Japanese Americans were forcibly removed from their homes without due process of law and were imprisoned in American style concentration camps. Also, there were restrictions on employment and they denied professional licenses to Asians. For example, uh, today we know there are a lot of Asian Americans that are school teachers, but that was not possible until about 1950. And also large corporations were very reluctant to hire Asian Americans because they questioned whether they would be loyal to the United States. In terms of where we lived, uh, redlining and housing covenants restricted where we could live. Um, I remember realtors uh, would ask um, if, if a Asian American family wanted to a neighborhood, the realtor would go to the neighbors and said, would you have any difficulty having an Asian as a neighbor? And if they did, the realtor would say, I'm sorry, this house is not for rent or not for sale. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that was very much uh, a case. But even as bad is that cemeteries were segregated. And so uh, you will find in areas where there are large numbers of, uh, of Asian Americans, there will be a separate cemetery uh, because uh, white people did not want to be buried next to Asians. Um, Immigration laws were changed in the mid 1960s, which suddenly allowed a much larger number of Asians who could come into the United States. And at the end of the Vietnam War brought um, Vietnamese soldiers, boat people, and other refugees from Asia, primarily Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, and others. And so we began seeing a huge rise in Asian populations here in the United States. Um, also in the 1880s and 90s, there was kind of fierce international trade competition between the US and Asia. And uh, in Detroit, Michigan, Vincent Chin, who the night before he was getting married, went out to have a bachelor party and they were at a bar and um, a couple of angry auto workers came in and mistook that he was of Japanese ancestry and they beat him up and killed him all because they were angry that there were too many Japanese cars being imported into the United States. In more recent times, we read about the killings in Atlanta the physical beatings and taunts and graffiti. Here in the greater Dayton area, we had two Asian businesses that had graffiti scrawled, go back to China because you brought COVID here. And uh, the, the restaurant was Vietnamese. Another one was a grocery store that was Laotian. They knew nothing about being in China, but they were mistaken. Now, let me talk a little bit about World War II and the Japanese American experience, because I think that um, it's important to understand what took place. When Japan bombed the United States at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, my family was living in Portland, Oregon, and my parents could hardly believe that Japan would do such a provocative thing. 
that night in Portland, uh, 27 Japanese American community leaders were rounded up and placed in jail. The next morning, my father, who was a Methodist minister, had a couple of his uh, parishioners call him and asked if my father would go visit them in jail, uh, their husbands in jail, and uh, would they take a suitcase full of clothing so that these folks had something to wear. Soon thereafter, there were some Buddhist women. They were not members of my dad's church, but they were Buddhist. And they came and said, uh, would you take suitcases of clothing to our husbands as well? Now, what happened is that several of the Buddhist priests were rounded up on the night of Pearl Harbor because somehow the government thought that the Buddhists worshiped the emperor of Japan. And so they thought they were uh, a security risk. A few weeks later, a curfew was imposed on Japanese Americans living along the West Coast. And so Japanese Americans were not allowed to travel more than five miles from their home. And they had to be home by eight o'clock in the evening. There was fear and hysteria throughout the Japanese American community. They really didn't know who to trust. And for all intents and purposes, they were personified as the enemy. On February 19th, 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which resulted in the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans, two thirds of which were American citizens by birth. There was never any trial, there were never any charges posed against them, but they were placed in American style concentration camps. And the government began rounding up Japanese Americans community by community in the Western US. The first one being in Bainbridge Island, Washington. And you can imagine there was a lot of Japanese, uh, anti-Japanese hysteria. My mother tells me that um, <clears throat> about this time, the uh, white women leaders of the local YWCA, whose families were pretty prominent people in the community, insisted that they be able to inspect the place where Japanese Americans would be incarcerated, which was the Pacific International Livestock Exposition Center. My mother, who uh, had two very young children, was invited to accompany them. And these women were just aghast at the deplorable conditions because they were gonna house human beings in animal stalls. And they insisted that at the very minimum, the government authorities needed to lay plywood on the dirt floors and at least clean and whitewash the stall walls. And as a consequence, the incarceration in Portland was delayed by a few days so that the government uh, could follow up on this. Now, all Japanese Americans living in the Western US were required to register with the government and each family was given a number. Japanese Americans were then given just a few days to gather up their belongings and their families the government confiscated Japanese American churches and community buildings so that they could become storage facilities for the belongings of Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans needed to pack their own bedding, clothing, personal items, and they could only bring what they could carry. Everything else had to be left behind. No pets were allowed. And if they happened to own a car, the vehicle had to be left behind. If they owned property, it had to be leased or left to someone else's care. So the Portland Japanese Americans spent the next few months in the Pacific International Livestock Exposition Center. Families were given an animal stall to sleep in, one family per stall. Meals were served in a mess hall and there was very little privacy. There was also very little to do 
1942 happened to be an extremely hot summer. And um, so all they could do between meals is really hide under the exposition stands to try to find some shade. Um, also, this PI center was downwind from a slaughterhouse and the smell was terrible. Um, and in the heat of the summer, the flies were just rampant. And so the government officials got fly paper, which is a sticky uh, substance to kind of trap flies. Within a few hours, those fly papers were just coated with flies and they were ultimately useless. And so this was a very, very difficult time. By the end of summer, they learned that a permanent facility was ready. And so they were boarded onto trains. They were told to pull the shades down because they didn't want people to know who was on the train. And they traveled to this unknown destination, which happened to be Hunt, Idaho, in Southern Idaho. And they went to Camp Minidoka. When they arrived, they saw the facility really wasn't finished. That um, um, still a lot of the, the army barracks that were being built hadn't even been started. Uh, the restrooms were, were in very, very short supply. And so quickly, the government hired these incarcerated persons who were able-bodied to actually work for the government for $18 a month. They built the remaining barracks. They acted as cooks, as uh, medical and first aid workers. Some were actually asked to teach school and uh, some other administrative positions. Um, later, as uh, harvest season came along, the government allowed some of these to actually be released from the camp to go out and harvest some of the crops because labor was in extremely short supply because of the war. Well, the camp uh, quickly constructed the army barracks. They were wood frame buildings with tar paper walls. The windows leaked. Um, you could overhear the neighbors uh, talking because in many cases, the walls did not go up to the ceiling. And the planks of wood on the floor, uh, they, it was gr very green lumber. And so there would be gaps in it. And um, eventually the residents tried to get smashed tin cans to fill the holes so that they wouldn't fall through the cracks. Um, then cold weather hit and the, the coal stoves and the, in the barracks were really not adequate. When it rained, the, the outside was just terribly, terribly muddy. And um, I'm told that it was just very, very difficult living. There weren't enough toilets. In fact, um, the, the toilets, the, the restrooms that they built, they were built for like an army facility. So the stools were there, but there were no walls. And uh, I, particularly the women found this very, very degrading not to be able to, to care for their, their uh, health uh, in a broad open room. And so many of them would wait till the middle of the night trying to go to the bathroom and they found out others were doing the same thing. <laughs> they could avoid it. Um, but probably the detention was the hardest on the adults. The adults, uh, particularly the immigrant generation, um, they, for, for one, only spoke a limited amount of English. And since all the instructions are in English, they had a hard time sometimes comprehending what was going on. The semblance of family life had all but disappeared. Um, and the elders really felt they had lost authority over their families. And um, the children, you know, now that they were eating in a mess hall, they could eat with their friends. They didn't have to eat with their families. And um, if you were in high school, that was kind of neat because heck, you could do things with your friends, even into the evening, your parents didn't worry about where you were because you were incarcerated and in a, uh, a fenced in facility with barbed wire even. Um, but you know, the, the young people really kind of enjoyed being in this setting. Um, 
Um, and, and this was really like a small city. And so they formed a camp council with a representative for each barrack block. Uh, schools were started, boy and girl scout troops were formed. Uh, they had sports like baseball and other things, and there were church services on Sunday. And so it was really almost like community life. Several of the residents uh, started planting other things so that so that there would at least be some greenery, uh, some semblance of, of, of life. But there were eight to 12,000 residents in each of 10 detention centers that the government set up. And as time progressed, the government thought that, you know, those who were students should be able to continue their education. And so uh, a group was chosen to kind of screen what students should be allowed to continue their education. Um, they had to be someone who was not going to cause trouble. And, um, and then uh, several of the church groups uh, provided funds for transportation and tuition. And uh, most of the students who did uh, leave to continue their education would work for their room and board. Um, in the case of my family, I had an uncle who was a graduate student at University of Minnesota. And um, he found a job for my father to teach Japanese to the Caucasian American soldiers. And between that job and a, and a, um, a he shoveled coal <laughs> for the furnaces, uh, my family was permitted to leave the incarceration camp and to live in Minneapolis. And a few months later, um, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles joined my family in Minneapolis where they could continue their education, find employment and kind of continue life. Um, now, when World War II ended, the Supreme Court had said the government no longer had permission to restrict where Japanese Americans live. And so most returned to the West Coast. But a few found jobs and, and found the Midwest to be a pretty good place to live. And so uh, places like Dayton, like Cincinnati, like Cleveland became um, uh, hospitable for that. Um, now, what was it like to grow up as an Asian American? I was born right after World War II, so I did not go through the wartime experience, although I was told story after story about it. But um, as I was growing up, my parents told me that all people were of worth and we needed to respect everyone. That I should be proud that I am a Japanese American and that I needed to be a good American citizen. And the way to get ahead was just study and work hard and get good grades. And uh, I just needed to do the best that I possibly could do. And whatever it was, I could never dishonor my family or my community. In other words, if I did something bad, it would reflect not only on me, but my family and my community. And yet I knew that I was different than other kids. I wasn't white. I wasn't black. I was other. And, you know, even when you had to fill out the forms, um, you, there, there were options of what you could put for your race. And we were considered other. Now, as Asian Americans, we were given certain pathways of what, what's the best way to move on and succeed. Uh, there were more than a dozen Asian American boys at my high school. And we were all encouraged to go to college major in science, engineering, or the technical fields. The assumption was that we were good at math and science, but we should refrain from fields that required strong writing skills or verbal skills. And in the end, one of, one of my group graduated from college in mathematics and went to work for the Postal Service delivering special delivery mail. The rest of us were drawn to liberal arts or other non-scientific fields. 
so that though we were pushed in one direction, we tended to go in a different direction. On the social scene, um, our parents really had limited contacts outside the Asian American community. And so they tended to encourage us as children to socialize with others like us, uh, with other families, with other individuals. And uh, part of that I'm sure was the fact that in my parents' generation, there were laws that forbid interracial marriage, what they called miscegenation laws. And so, um, you know, they even formed groups to basically give us places where we could kind of uh, get together with other people, hopefully that we would find someone that would be good to date and maybe eventually marry. Um, then let me talk briefly about what it meant to be an Asian American with this whole uh, thing about being a model minority. Model minority was a term that was invented probably in the 1960s. And it had the effect of pitting Asian Americans against our black and brown sisters and brothers. That, you know, we were kind of lifted up as the, the way you really ought to, uh, 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 ought to, to be and, and live with. Um, and, and not like lower achieving individuals. Now, when I was in college at Portland State University, I had an Asian American sociology instructor and uh, he was working on his PhD, but uh, he was on a team that uh, looked at the behavior of Seattle, Washington high school students. The assumption was that Asian American students were viewed as being model students, that African American kids were seen as lower achievers and more likely to be disruptive in school. Asian Americans were assumed to be higher achievers and outstanding students. But their observation in the classroom was that really there was little difference between the Asian American and black students that um, that no, in fact, in many cases, Asian Americans got away with more misbehavior than the black students. The moment a black student misbehaved, they were sent to the principal's office or, you know, disciplined. Asian American students, they kind of turned the other way and said, well, that's okay. And so, you know, this stereotype of model minority is extremely disruptive. It's a, it's a myth, it is inaccurate, and it creates wedges between different groups of people and should be avoided. Now today there are about 345,000 Asian Americans living in Ohio, or about 3% of the population. But we are a very diverse, group of people. We didn't all come from the same country. We actually came from several Asian countries and we speak over 15 different languages. And in most cases, we can't understand each other. <laughs> we have unique country customs and traditions that are uh, particular to our ethnic group. And um, some uh, immigrated to the United States very recently. Others, uh, like my family, has been here three generations. My grandparents came here over 100 years ago. Um, so we are not all alike. Now, when you talk to people casually on the street, they say, oh, yeah, all Asians are alike. Well, we aren't. And we want to be valued for who we are. And yet we share a common humanity. We face uh, many of the same problems and challenges as Asian Americans. We strive to be recognized for who we are. We wanna be valued for the contributions we bring. And yet we have a great deal of pride in our cultural heritage and our ancestry. Here in the Dayton area, we have several Asian American organizations, mostly 
formed by the individual ethnic groups. Um, and we find these groups really help to keep our communities connected because here in Dayton and in most of Ohio, Asian Americans are not uh, clustered in a particular neighborhood. They're kind of spread out. And, uh, and, and so these uh, Asian American organizations help to bring a bond. Uh, with the immigrant generation, sometimes they can come together and speak in a native language or, or share food together and do things like this. So it's very important. Now, right now, um, I'm working with several Asian American groups on some legislation here in the state of Ohio that would in, make Asian American history and contributions a part of the regular school curriculum. Uh, we think that's important because um, we think it's important for all children in Ohio to know the history and the values that Asian Americans have brought to this state. Now, <laughs> already state curriculum requires lessons on African American history, Mexican American history, Puerto Rican history, and Native American history. So why not Asian American history? And it's gonna be an uphill battle because uh, many people say, well, you're still a very small group. We don't need to worry about you. Well, we feel differently about that. So maybe that's, that, that's talking long enough. And um, I'm sure that uh, hopefully I've, I've helped you to, uh, to have a little better idea of who we are as Asian Americans, but I would really invite you if you have comments or questions, uh, I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. So who has the first question? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So I was adopted from a Chinese orphanage. Um, hmm. My question hmm. is, why is there so much hate against Asians just because they're confused with the government being communist or what's the deal with it? <laughs> but we well, don't get hate from, uh, for anybody, any other race, it's only the Asians that, that get all the hate and there's no love, there's no support, nothing. Well, it's difficult. And, and one of the things that our Asian American organization is trying to help to be supportive of people in our community so that when these ugly incidents happen, we are there to respond to it. Um, last year, when all this anti-Asian hate came, particularly uh, with the pinnacle of the, the women that were killed in Atlanta, um, we had several rallies to really say there is no place for this. Um, but it, it, it's misidentification. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, many of us have been here for three, four, maybe five generations. You know, we're, we're as American as anyone else. And yet um, there, there is this stigma. And uh, part of it is, is more than anything else, it's ignorance. Um, and so that's why we feel it's really important um, to, to, to share uh, more about the contributions, the values that we hold, because it is uh, very important. Now that the fact that you're adopted, I have two nieces who also are adopted. They came from Asia um, and- you Were know, they adopted from China? Uh, they actually came from Japan and one from Korea. And, um, you know, they were raised by my brother and sister-in-law who are both Asian. And, um, you know, they were raised as though they were their own children. So, um, you know, but I do know that, um, you know, families that adopt sometimes, there are not as many opportunities to really appreciate one's cultural uh, history. And um, so, you know, we really encourage um, folks to get in touch with, with what their, uh, their ancestry is. And, uh, you know, and hopefully uh, we will overcome that. But, you know, 
it, it, it's nothing that just happens instantly. It's something happens over time. And so, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's through classes like this, maybe it's through college uh, groups that we can help to um, enlighten people that we're human beings like everyone else and we should be accepted. Uh, unfortunately, with some of the uh, uh, politicians uh, trying to gain political points, they think it's it's fun to 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 um, denigrate um, persons uh, who immigrated from Asia. And uh, you know, it, I, I watched the the TV ads, you know, talking about we got to keep immigrants out. Well. <laughs> The truth of the matter is the American society is stronger today because we've had immigration. We are more diverse and we need to help the, the total community to understand that we bring value. We help to bring uh, new ideas. We help to, um, to, to make this a better place to live. So, you know, it, it, it's not saying that we can change overnight, but it's saying that we need to work on and continue to work on. Thank you so much. I think Whoopi, Whoopi, please unmute Whoopi. yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Yu. Thank you for um, hosting the lecture. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Hayashi, thank you so much for um, sharing the uh, the history and the uh, exp your experiences with us uh, tonight. I have a question. Um, looking at the history from the 19th century, 20th century, and then we are um, in the 21st century now. Have you seen any progress um, for Asian Americans? Um, I understand the, um, the racial issues are still ongoing and discrimination, um, discriminative actions are still prevalent in our communities here. And um, from your perspective, from your experience, and when you were sharing with your, um, with you being a community leaders, um, based upon um, your experiences, what has happened in the United States? Have have we experienced any better um, or improvements for Asian Americans living here in the, in the states? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I I, I guess. Uh two areas where I think there has been clear improvement. Number one, um, we now have Asian Americans gain elected to uh, political office, both at the local, the state and the national level. Um, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris is of partial Asian ancestry. Uh, first time that has ever happened. Um, here in the state of Ohio, we have two uh, Asian Amer persons of Asian ancestry in the Ohio Senate. And uh, so that's, that's good. Also, um, in terms of uh, business, and, and we do have Asian Americans who are owning businesses um, and, and doing that. But um, the other phenomena that is taking place uh, amongst Asian Americans, and, and my family is a case of it. My wife is Caucasian. And so our child, uh, who's now a young adult, is biracial. But um, as we begin to have mixed race people, I think it begins to open the door in some ways that maybe previously, uh, where we were totally isolated, it was more difficult to do so. So I think there has been some uh, benefit there. Um, I would have to say, because my last position was working primarily in an African-American neighborhood, that uh, I don't live in nearly the fear that my African-American sisters and brothers have to deal with. You know, they have to worry, is the police going to stop me and question me? Um, am I going to be harassed and these other things? I think, generally speaking, Asian-Americans, for the most part, have not had to experience that kind of indignity. Um, and, um, you know, it isn't to say that we're being treated perfectly, we aren't, but at least, um, you know, we need to continue to work for that. And, uh, you know, when I lived in California, we had, uh, I went to high school with a lot of Mexican Americans. 
And frankly, um, many of them did not graduate high school, um, partially because they had to work to support their families. Um, and hopefully some of those things are changing for the better. Um, education is clearly a pathway for betterment, but it, it's not a cure-all for everything. Um, we also know that there are health disparities. I mean, we've seen with COVID that African-Americans are far more likely uh, to get uh, gravely ill and in ca some cases die because of COVID at a much higher rate than do uh, Asians or whites. And so we need to continue to work uh, to improve uh, healthcare so that um, we don't have those kind of disparities. Um, but that, that, that's an ongoing struggle. And I think each one of us needs to do our part to, uh, to be open and to, uh, to help to make things better for others. You know, I, I was talking to you about uh, the women from the YWC in Portland taking my mother to see where Japanese Americans are being incarcerated. This was not simply an action by Japanese Americans on their own, but it was in partnership with others. And, um, you know, my parents always reminded me that um, we need to reach out for each other because we didn't do it on our own. We did it together. And uh, that's the, the community that we are. And um, I think that's the important, each one of us can do something, whether it's uh, uh, offering to help someone, maybe it's just a smile, or maybe it's just a friendly gesture, but we need to take those steps to say to others, uh, I care about you. And uh, when we do that, we will all be strengthened and, and made better by that. So, you know, it, 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 it's not a, a, a done deal. It, it's an ongoing task. And like, you know, many of us feel like, you know, teaching Asian American history should be a no brainer. <laughs> we should want to do that. But uh, it, we're having a very difficult time even gain that uh, uh, legislation passed here in Ohio. Um, you know, uh, so it's an ongoing struggle and we just have to continue to work together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Hayashi, I have one question. Uh, yes. Especially, so I'm teaching the anti-Asian racism class at my college. Mm -hmm. So this was actually required by our Asian Asian American students. So after the Atlanta shooting last year, so our students organized the March for Asian Lives. So lots of people join us. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we had conversations with our presidents. Mm -hmm. And then like um, students suggested um, us to like have this kind of course uh, to address mm -hmm. the anti-racism. So mm -hmm. I'm teaching it. I think for, uh, I have learned so much from my students, but I think I just did my midterm evaluation yesterday. So I had some um, uh, suggestions. I got lots of great feedback and suggestions from my students. So I think for one student, um, I think I have, I, I think there are two main sets of questions. So one is about the, uh, the content of this kind of education. So because for this course, I have like four required readings, like mm -hmm. the, the first textbook is Asian American history, very brief introduction. The second one is No No Boy, uh, mm -hmm. the very well-known fiction. And then after spring break, we will read the best we could do an illustration memoir like about the Vietnam War. And then we will read like um, uh, academic book, The Myth of Model Minority. So mm -hmm. uh, at this stage, one student said that, um, yes, 
it's it's important to learn about history. But I hope that our class could focus more on the present and in the future, so that the whole education teaching will be more uh, present oriented and future oriented. Mm -hmm. So that is one um, uh, suggestion. I value the I value my students' feedback very much. Another suggestion is about the content. Um, so we talked a lot about like the um, anti-Asian racism, discrimination, and mm -hmm. in class. And one student suggested us to focus, suggested me to focus more on the action-centered content. Mm -hmm. So they actually started uh, from the first week. They often ask me, "What can we do? What can we do? What can we do to make the change? And what can we do to make our society better?" Um, so because you are like very, uh, you are brilliant community leader and also you have given so many wonderful talks. So I wonder if you have any advice for me and a suggestion for me. Well, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you know, I, I, I guess we, we all can learn from each other. Here in Dayton for uh, 40 some years, we have had something called the Dayton International Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't had it the last two years because of COVID. And we're hoping to do it again. But we currently have 38 countries. We have nonprofit groups in 38 communities that come together. We have our food. We have uh, some merchandise. We have some cultural displays. We have entertainment. And, you know, we draw 20 to 30,000 people on a weekend to come out for this. And I think, you know, people kind of are curious about this. They want to learn from each other. Uh, when I was in college, um, we found that, you know, if we could have food, <laughs> people found <laughs> different foods kind of interesting. And uh, if you have some folks who, who can do that, that is a way to kind of get folks, because I think, all of us want to eat and we're kind of interested in trying things that are a little different than we have now. Now, not too different, but at least something that, that is tasty, you know? Um, so that would be another thing. You know, um, I know at Wright State, some of the Asian American students, they do a kind of a cultural night where they have dance and other things. And so that would be another possibility of how can we share um, and, and, and it isn't just Asian, it could be, you know, some of the European groups could do similar things. But I just think the more that we could learn, could have that interaction, uh, you know, we're coming up on St. Patrick's Day. I don't know if at College of Worcester you have any kind of things, but I, I bet you the Irish are very proud on St. Patrick's Day. Now, do we do the same thing on Lunar New Year? Do we celebrate Chinese New Year's? Do we do other things like that? Those are the kinds of things that I think we can learn from each other. And we're, we're a richer community because of that. Um, so, you know, that would be another possibility. Um, but, you know, the fact that you're teaching Asian American culture and history is wonderful. And uh, we, we are glad that you're doing that. We just need to, to spread it further along. Thank you so much for your great advice. Uh, Cynthia Zhang, so please unmute yourself and ask your questions. Cynthia Zhang. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I have, uh, you know, I was really uh, moved by um, uh, Dr. Hayashi's uh, talk, um, you know, because I, 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 I I, I read a lot of uh, stories about what happened to Japanese Americans and because I'm in the uh, West Coast area. So, um, you know, th there are some museums and everything about mm -hmm. that. And so um, obviously what happened at that time to the Japanese Americans is very similar to what is happening now <laughs> to Chinese or Chinese Americans. Well, to Chinese, to Muslims, to, you know, to other groups that are singled out right. and uh yeah we need to stand up for each other right yeah we because need to stand up for each other. Strand, stranded between your home country and then you know the you know the the the, the status quo and everything yes. 
So um, I, I would like to ask you this question. Obviously you have um, kind of like psychologically, if I may say that word, um, adapted to the uh, to the um, kind of like um, the trauma, you know. Um, so, you know, in terms of your personal life, your adaptation to the whole community and everything, um, was that, so if I can, I don't know whether this is a personal question or not, um, how does this, this process, you know, like, it's almost like you're not wanted by both sides, right, <laughs> Japan and US, and then, and then you had to, I mean, you know, like, uh, obviously, uh, from what I read that the Japanese Americans went to, to Japan to fight the Second World War for, for the United States. And many of them, most of them died because the, the tasks they had were basically difficult and things like that. So, yeah. so I just wonder, um, yeah. Well, let, let, let me just, uh, it isn't that most of them died, but a large number of them were either injured and, and frankly, several were killed. It was one of the, the, the highest fatalities of any, uh, any unit in the, in the U.S. Army. And the reason why they were a segregated unit is that at that time, the United States did not feel that Japanese Americans should, should fight side by side with whites, um, you know, and, and same thing with, with African-Americans. They had a Negro unit uh, that was separate and they kept them separate. Um, and, and, you know, sadly, because of the sacrifice that the 442nd Regimental Combat Team with such high fatalities, they, they had one of the highest uh, rates of purple hearts and, and, and other things. Um, life did get better for Japanese Americans because people began to see that, yes, these are loyal Americans. Uh, one of the things the 442nd did in Italy was they saved a battalion from Texas that had been totally encircled by the Nazis. And uh, though there were a lot of Japanese American lives that were lost. They saved the, 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 the Texas Battalion. And as a consequence after the war, uh, Texas named all the members of the 442nd were honorary citizens of Texas. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that, that, that's not something that in 1945 would have been really popular, but because of the sacrifice that was made, there became the realization that, yeah, these really are, uh, are, are, are good people and, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, the other thing I would have to say is that, yes, World War II was a very dark page in American history, but I think what is even more remarkable are the accomplishments that the Japanese American families uh, had after World War II. They began getting employed in fields that previously they were prohibited from entering. Uh, they began to uh, raise themselves up economically. Um, they, they did very well for themselves, but they also helped each other out. And, uh, you know, um, my, my niece works for the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, they're collecting artifacts that families have of things during World War II. And she said, uh, you know, that's important, but what else do we need to do? And I says, you need to tell the story of how uh, these individuals who were very much uh, ostracized during World War II, what they did to overcome the hardships as they return to their communities on the West Coast and in other parts of the United States. How did they uh, better themselves? How did they overcome the stigma and the discrimination that they, they faced? And, uh, you know, that's probably as important as anything that uh, we need to tell that story. And uh, so, you know, there, there isn't a cure-all for this. But I think we just have to do what we can, and we have to do it one person at a time, and we will help to overcome that 
difficulty. Thank you so much. I just uh, so Mochi, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Lovely. Um, so I am currently a student at the College of Worcester, a sophomore, and I'm actually currently taking um, Dr. Yo's anti-Asian racism course and loving it. Um, as someone who is of uh, Japanese American descent myself, it's really, really, it feels great to like have that kind of representation, but also have the opportunity to not only share, but learn kind of beyond just the experience. Because something you said that really resonated with me is Asian American is very much an, is an umbrella term. And I think it was really important to develop it as such, but kind of also recognizing the individual communities within that. So my question is kind of centered more towards what you were saying towards the end of your talk about really not only intersectional advocism, um, but also specifically sharing each other's cultures and kind of really not just fighting for Asian Americans specifically, but going and having um, co-conspirative ship with other minority and marginalized identities. So mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering, um, can you kind of speak more on that in terms of some strategies that we can employ um, in our own personal everyday lives on how we can be um, kind of more cognizant of that intersectionality? Well, I, I, I think for those that you have uh relationships with, you need to get to know each other. You need to, um, you know, uh, find out uh, about uh, what their cultural background is, what their interests are. Um, you know, uh, I had the, 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 the good fortune um, at various points in my life to work with other racial ethnic groups. And uh, my last eight years of work or six years here in Dayton, was working at a community center that was 90% African-American. And, um, you know, I uh, was just um, kind of astounded by uh, the challenges that African-American parents as well as children have in terms of everyday life. Um, you know, and it isn't simply an economic question, but it's the stress, the other difficulties that they have, and just knowing that there were other people there that cared for them, that supported them, was very, very important. And, uh, you know, part of what I would say to them is, you know, I, I know that these are challenging and difficult times, but we all go through those at various points in our life. But if we do this together, we can overcome uh, almost any obstacle that's there. And there are people that are ready and willing to work with you and willing to, to be helpful uh, to you in that. And so each one of us as an individual can reach out and support another. Um, and, and part of that is learning about another person's uh, history, about another person's culture, uh, but also um, to share with them your experiences. Uh, and, and, and that's a two-way street. It isn't just one way or the other. Um, and I think we all benefit uh, from that. Um, and, you know, uh, if there are events that can help to to bring that intersection, that, that can certainly uh, amplify and help with that. Um, but I, I just think uh, entering into conversation, into dialogue, uh, maybe going out and eating together or, or spending an evening uh, talking, maybe studying a book together or going to the movie together and talking about it afterwards. Those are all ways in which we get to know each other and we get beyond just the stereotypes that we have about each other, but we really get to know each other. And that, that is a, a big benefit. And um, 
you know, I, I think you're living in a world that this is going to be even more important um, as we move forward. Um, so I, I, I hope that might be, be, be helpful to you. But if, if there's more, I'd be glad to, to sit and talk further about that. Thank you. Um, so Professor Adams, uh, so I saw that you typed your question. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, Professor Adams? Uh, 
So I hope that might be helpful, Dr. Adams. Any other questions or comments? Um, so I probably, I, may I ask a final question? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> yeah, so I wonder how the COVID-19 pandemic um, has like impacted Asian and Asian American communities in Ohio. I know the pandemic has affected everyone, but it probably has affected every person in different ways. So for the Asian and Asian American communities in Ohio, so how do you perceive the impacts? Yeah. I, I, I think the fallout from COVID-19 is more the anti-Asian hate that has come out. In terms of the medical health, I don't believe that we've had any percentage higher incidence than any other group. Um, and, uh, but the first thing is, does everyone have access to healthcare that needs that? And um, we're, we're a small enough group that it doesn't make a, a lot of difference, but I know the Philippine American organization here in Dayton did uh, a series of vaccinations at a, at a public clinic and they really opened so that their members can make sure that they got the vaccinations. Um, some of the Asian communities, like I comment about the India Club, they have so many doctors in their group that obviously they know they have the medical personnel to offer that. But, um, you know, I think we need to deal with some of the disparities that may be there. So, um, you know, that's something that, that has to be dealt with. Um, in, but I think the biggest fallout from COVID-19 has been the rise in anti-Asian hate, which is largely uh, fostered by those uh, political leaders who have used this as a way to scapegoat groups, calling it the Kung flu and these other things. Uh, there's really no need for any of that but they have chosen to do it because they think it has a political benefit for themselves. And at the same time, it creates uh, huge disparities. Um, uh, I think the killings in, in, in Atlanta really helped to raise that. But you know, we have just as much discrimination in other communities, maybe not killings, but we have hate activities that, that take place. And uh, so the more we can work together to overcome that, the better off we are. So, um, uh, you know, I don't have all the, 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 uh, the, stat, the figures on that, but I do know that there are concerns about the mental health of Asian Americans because um, people were feeling like they were kind of pushed out or, or in some way uh, disadvantaged because of their Asian ancestry, which, you know, <laughs> obviously didn't need to be there at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk and also for answering our questions and also for sharing your wisdom and compassion with us. <laughs> Um, okay, I think everyone, you may either turn on your camera and applaud, or you may <laughs> use the applause reactions. Um, so let's just uh, thank um, Mr. Hayashi for a wonderful um, conversation with us. Thank you so much. Well, 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 you're very welcome. And if there's any opportunity that I might have to, to interact with any of you again, I hope uh, you will be in touch. And uh, I, I, I have valued this, this time together. I appreciate your questions and your comments. And, uh, you know, we, we're in this together and we'll keep working at it. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, that's it for tonight. So we will have other, like this AAPI lecture series actually have four lectures. So uh, tonight we have the second lecture. So please watch for our further notification about the third and the fourth lecture. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.